Hello, and welcome to Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. My name is Ben Houck, and I'm pleased to be able to introduce the 12th episode in our ongoing series. Our August 2023 podcast features a conversation with Professor Paul Sukup of Santa Clara University, a Jesuit priest and author of seven books, including Communication and Theology, Christian Communication, Media, Culture, and Catholicism, Mass Media and the Moral Imagination, Fidelity and Translation, Communicating the Bible and New Media, Out of Eden, and most recently, A Media Ecology of Theology. The interview is conducted by IGS President Lance Strait, and their discussion ranges across topics such as Jesuit education, language, environmentalism, religion, and media. Let's hear what they have to say. Oh, welcome to another episode of Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. I'm here with Paul Sukup. Paul is a professor of communication at Santa Clara University, uh, where he's the Pedro Arupe. Did I say that right? Yes. Uh, Pedro Arupe, SJ professor. Paul is also a Roman Catholic priest in the order of the Society of Jesus, better known, uh, more popularly known as the Jesuits uh, at Santa Clara. He is a full professor with tenure, and as I mentioned, uh, with the endowed chair, uh, and he teaches courses in technology and communication. And he's the author or editor of a number of books uh, that includes Communication and Theology, uh, Christian Communication, Media, Culture, and Catholicism, Mass Media and Moral Imagination, Fidelity and Translation, and that's on communicating the Bible and new media, and most recently, A Media Ecology of Theology. Uh, he's also co-edited with Tom Farrell four volumes of the collected works of Walter Ong uh, under the title Faith and Contexts, uh, as well as uh, a uh, collection of essays applying Ong's thought of Ong and media ecology, uh, essays in communication, composition, and literary studies, actually another volume of Ong's work, uh, uh, Walter Ong Reader, and uh, also a book of biblical meditations on communication, Out of Eden, Seven Ways God Restores Blocked Communication. So welcome, Paul. Thank you very much, Lance. And it's good to have you here. And uh, you, uh, and I should mention that Santa Clara University is in California. It's the Jesuit University of Northern California in the Silicon Valley area. Uh, and uh, you yourself are a native Californian, are you not? Yes, uh, I am one who's grown up in Los Angeles. Uh, both my parents, though, had come from other parts of the United States. So as so many people, Californians are uh, kind of immigrants to the state. But I had grown up here, and I've spent probably most of my uh, my life in California. I studied in St. Louis for a while, did my graduate work at the University of Texas, uh, and then back to California. So you did your undergraduate work in California then, or? Well, it was split because part of it was the seminary that I was in. And so we did some of the studies here in California and then uh, went to a university, St. Louis University in St. Louis, uh, to finish the the work, uh, that seminary education included specialized work in philosophy and theology, and so we did the basis of that uh, at one of these centers, one of them which is at St. Louis University. Uh, I think now that you have one at Fordham, there are a number of the Jesuit seminarians who work on some of their uh, philosophy work at Fordham. Mm -hmm. And I take it that it was at St. Louis that you met Walter Ong then? Yes, although I had corresponded with him, uh, interestingly, because I had mentioned to uh, someone that I was interested in studying communication, and they said, oh, well, you, you really need to meet, uh, you know, Walter Ong. So I wrote a letter of introduction, and very kindly, uh, you know, of course, this is all by 
literally not email, but by letters. Uh, you know, he wrote back and suggested things to read, uh, some of his own particular uh, work, uh, you know, and so I began dipping into that, but it was only when I got to St. Louis uh, that I had, had met him and then was able to take a course with him. So when exactly did you decide to that you wanted to enter the priesthood, uh, since that seems to be uh, something that's come up rather early for you? Yes, I mean, sometimes I, I joke about it, that it's hard for me to remember what I was thinking uh, in those years. But, you know, I, I do remember it, it felt like a fit for me. Uh, there, there was an affinity for things of worship and church uh, with our local uh, church. You know, it just it felt like a good place to be. And then uh, this was still kind of the era where it was typical that somebody would start a seminary program around the time for college. Uh, and so after high school, you know, it's still... It made sense. I had studied uh, at a Jesuit high school and got to know some of the Jesuits there uh, and then, you know, went through it. I do remember a little bit struggling, you know, is what should I decide? Is this right? You know, and finally, one of the uh, the Jesuit counselors just says, well, you know, why not? You know, instead of trying to answer the question, why? Just see, you know, and, and then it did work, you know. So it was a place I felt very comfortable, a sense of uh, certainly a growth identity, a sense that here is where I'm finding God. So you went in that direction, but you also, and when did you decide to specialize to the extent that you do in the field of communication? You know, that was again, probably by the time I was, uh, got to St. Louis, uh, you know, I was very well aware that, uh, Many of the Jesuits teach at universities, and one needs an area of teaching. Uh, I thought through, you know, what are the things in my life that have interested me? And the, the common theme was communication, whether it had been, you know, working on the school newspaper, doing dramatics, doing uh, rhetoric, and, you know, other kind of speech things. Uh, and this was also the time in which communication study in the U.S. was beginning to pick up. Uh, and... So I had kind of a little bit of a gap. I was there at St. Louis and, and got some initial courses, but then really didn't need to do any kind of formal specialization until after I had finished the master's degree in theology. Uh, and so that added another several years uh, from doing the work at St. Louis University, uh, teaching at a high school, which was very typical for our seminary you know, uh, process at the time, then doing the, the uh, degree in theology. So it was really while I was studying theology, I went to, in more in depth to look at communication and particular approaches to it. And since I, I would assume that many of our listeners are not familiar, particularly familiar with yeah. the Jesuits, and, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about what what is a Jesuit? And, yeah. and you know, for that matter, um, you know, for those who are not uh, Roman Catholic like myself, um, you know, although I've spent enough time that I've become a bit familiar with it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, why is there such a thing as Jesuit uh, as a, and these other kinds of groupings within the church? Yeah. So, I mean, over the, the centuries of uh, Catholicism as part of Christianity, there were uh, different well, I'll call them spiritualities. People felt drawn to following God in one way or another. Uh, some wanted to withdraw from the world, and those were very early on, uh, you know, St. Anthony of the Desert, and then later in the Western uh, uh, Church, uh, St. Benedict, who would set up an idea of, of a, a monastic life, which would be structured around prayer throughout the day. Uh, and it was often that prayer based in the Psalms uh, and collective recitation of the Psalms. They became places of education as well. Uh, by the 16th century, which is when the Jesuits started, you had groups like the Franciscans, whose spirituality is more of a nature spirituality. And we always think of, you know, St. Francis, you know, with the, the hymn, the brother, son, sister, moon, a recognition that, that God can be discovered in nature and through nature. Uh, others like uh, Dominicans who focus on a particular kind of work, a preaching, a uh, a rhetorical approach to Christianity. Uh, Ignatius Loyola, who was the founder of the Jesuits, uh, had a conversion experience, and he wanted to apply a military background, which had been what he grew up with, 
uh, into a service of Christianity. This is the time of the Reformation, great upheaval in Western Europe. Uh, and he realized that what was needed was a group that wouldn't be connected or tied to a monastery, uh, but would have to go out in kind of whatever missions might be there. You can hear the sort of military thinking behind. Uh, but he wanted them to be very well educated. And for the 16th century, this group uh, began doing that, both with the uh, personal education, but often when they got to one place or another, they were asked to start schools. This is part of the uh, the great European uh, development of, of schools. Uh, and so then as the, that group caught on, they founded more and more schools. They were also sent literally as missionaries. They were Jesuits sent early on to China as you had the... Uh, connection between uh, Europe and China. Uh, and Jesuits in, exactly. Uh, in South America and others. Uh, the interesting take on some of that is many times the Jesuits were aligned with the indigenous peoples, defending them against the Spanish and Portuguese uh, colonialists, which led to all kinds of other conflicts. Uh, and so as we come into the, the, the current period, uh, the Jesuits are known as educators, but also could do different kinds of, of work. Uh, the spirituality is much more of an active spirituality. So rather than simply a, a monastic approach to the world, it's to find God out in the world and doing whatever the actions may be. Uh, I mean, that gives you a quick summary. Uh, we could take you know more than the time we have just to talk about that that aspect. Uh, but so, well, you find Jesuit schools in the U.S., the history of that, uh, and a spirituality that does appeal to many people, not only Jesuits, uh, but it's a spirituality of uh, of prayer, of contemplation, but in an active kind of setting. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it's very interesting to hear that. And I also, I think uh, what folks may not be aware of is that uh, you tend to think of priests as tied to a parish, uh, but that's not the case for the Jesuits, right? Yes, uh, because within the Catholic Church, there are, if you want, two types of uh, priests. One are uh, parish priests, and they're attached to a place, typically a, a diocese or a location, you know, which could be San Jose, for example, here in California, where I am. And then there are the priests who are members of the religious orders. So the Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuits, and so on, where we could be sent anywhere in the world. We're not attached to one place, but rather to the community. And then the work that the community has it could be a school, could be a retreat center. Uh, we have other Jesuits working in refugee centers, for example. Uh, and so the work is, is what holds them to a particular location. Mm -hmm. And that emphasis on education, I think, uh, and at least for some of our listeners who are uh, very much interested in the founder of General Semantics, Alfred Korzybski, uh, and he was a Polish nobleman, uh, the equivalent of a count, uh, born in 1879 in Poland at a time when Poland was subsumed by the Russian Tsarist Empire. Um, and my understanding is that his education was a Jesuit education, which, uh, as I understand it, also is not atypical that you guys at least um, educate, if not everyone, certainly the elite uh, within uh, Catholic societies. So uh, to your, you know, to the extent that you might be uh, aware of the tradition of Jesuit education, what would his uh education and, and I'm here you know, I'm thinking you know particularly uh you know that this would have been primary secondary education that because he did then went on uh for a degree in engineering um but prior to that he would have had that background so what would that have been like you know here we're talking about the end of the 19th century yeah, yeah probably at that time you would have had, especially at the, the secondary education, what now we might call a rhetorical education. So the early Jesuit model uh, set up in the 16th century looked to uh, focus on uh, almost the, the, the trivium, you know, the rhetoric, uh, dialectic, uh, logic. And then the idea would be to be trained in the classics to give the person a 
facility with a sort of common body of knowledge that could be focused into critical thinking, if we want to use the contemporary sort of things, uh, and community service as part of that. That's why you, you mentioned often you got the elites, because here are people who are interested in doing something in the in their community. Uh, you know, it, it changes uh, as we move into the 20th century because the influence of so many other educational systems, uh, uh, disciplinary specialization and, and so on, uh, and so even with something like Santa Clara, we were founded in 1851, and you would have had that classical 19th century rhetorical Renaissance kind of education. But by 1905, they added a, a, a commercial or a business program. Later, they added the sciences, you know, and, and so on. So it becomes like a university we would recognize in the U.S. probably by the 1930s. So I guess in Korzybski would have had the the high school equivalent in that kind of grounding. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's very helpful, you know, again, for folks who are particularly interested in in Korzybski that, uh, you know, sometimes it might be a puzzle how someone who only studied engineering uh, came to develop all of this, you know, this entire uh, discipline of general semantics, but having that kind of background in the trivium in the liberal arts uh i imagine was a rather rigorous education yeah and i, I think so with the uh, the situation in uh, eastern europe in in poland and others i mean often it was those schools that also grounded the kind of national identity uh you know the the resistance to the russian incursion would have been often in the schools and what I take it from that also, I mean, especially given rhetoric, the importance of rhetoric would be a heightened awareness of language that would come out of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was language study as well, because all of those schools would have required, you know, Latin and Greek. I mean, certainly through the 19th century, Latin was the language for higher education. Uh, and so they would have simply had to have a mastery of that in the high school to like, go to university. And, you know, again, from my experience at Fordham, one of the, let's say, catchphrases for the Jesuits is eloquentia perfecta. Yes. Uh, could you perhaps uh, tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I mean, literally, it's, uh, you know, uh, perfect eloquence, uh, the way of finding the correct way of placing one's idea, uh, clear thinking, uh, a way that is uh, accessible to the audience. You know, we can even take the, the sort of uh, canons of rhetoric, and you find that incorporated in this. Uh, many of the Jesuit schools like to expand that eloquentia perfecta, not just to the spoken word, but to the written word, so that people will write in a clear, accessible style. Uh, they will write in a style, though, that is not just bare bones, but somehow has a, a, a good, uh, readable quality to it. Uh, and then the same thing we could apply into other things like the arts. Uh, the, I think Krasinski's concern for language grows out of that type of a appreciation for how arguments can be placed. Uh, similarly, you can look at Fordham or any of the other Jesuit schools and you say, well, you've got a drama department. And part of that is coming out of this as well. Mm -hmm. But you'll, you know, what you said, and I, I think it particularly resonates for general semantics and the idea of clear thinking and, and accessible, you know, to make, uh, and, and it's almost an anti-rhetoric in that, in that sense, uh, which, you know, again, draws on science as its sort of lodestar for developing clear expression and, and, and clear ways of understanding the world. But uh, to do, you know, to emphasize that clarity of thought and expression um, is really yeah, and I, part of it yeah I, I can't help but think you know with someone like Korzybski uh given the fact that he had to master several different languages uh he has a uh, uh an awareness of how language works I mean if as a child he would have to learn Latin and probably Greek uh in the schools with his own you know native uh, Polish and I don't know what other languages he might have spoken there, and then later English. So he's going to have a sensitivity to how these things work. He would have been exposed to Russian, certainly, because he was actually, yeah. it's not clear uh, in 
to what extent it was forced. But when World War One broke out, he had to uh, he served in the Russian army. Um, and he also uh, knew French and then, of course, English. Um, yeah. So all of that fits together. Uh, and, you know, that other part of it, the sort of um, social justice emphasis, the because uh, mm -hmm. part of his initial motivation and really uh, throughout was to make the world a better place and mm -hmm. particularly the prevention of war, the kind of uh, and it, gave rise to a lot of peace and justice studies and uh, also just sanity in a more personal kind of form, yeah. uh, which also makes me think of the, uh, you know, another of the Jesuit uh, phrases, uh, originally men for others, but we yeah. now say men and women for others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because then I, that idea is part of that sense of service, that our education is not for just personal benefit it's not so somebody can you know have a career and become wealthy but rather it really is an education to serve the community uh the the, the basis we have is community whether that becomes our civic community our religious community uh you know and it's it's something not unique to jesuit education or others because i think most religious you know groups would, would focus on that as well we, we have an obligation to one another we have an obligation of care yeah. Well, since you bring that up, I'm going to confess, Father, uh, <laughs> that uh, when I did a term as chair, uh, you know, I was often called on to uh, you know, kind of write stuff up and, and make arguments for various things. And I, you know, invoke Jesuit values mm -hmm. in doing so. And I really didn't know very much about it. I mean, I didn't have that background being Jewish myself. Um, so I just substituted Jewish values in place. And I remember mm -hmm. one day uh, a member of our department who was a Jesuit, uh, Mike Tuith, uh, I'm oh, yeah. sure you yeah. met him, oh, yes. uh, came by and, and said, you know, I really liked what you wrote. You really do understand what the Jesuits are all about. Uh, <laughs> and, and I didn't, I didn't, come clean with him but uh, <laughs> uh well but, but but you're right i mean that there is a commonality there i mean in terms of even the heritage we always talk about the judeo-christian heritage ignatius loyola you know the founder of the, of the jesuits uh traveled to jerusalem in fact he wanted to spend his life in jerusalem and then he was expelled because the uh the, the turks or whoever was in charge you know were cleaning the place out this is all very interesting, and uh, I guess uh, you know uh, one other thing to to maybe ask you about is that uh, uh, not too long ago the uh, the church elected a Jes the first time ever a Jesuit mm -hmm. pope, uh, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it depends on how much history you want. I mean, Jesuits because Ignatius had this idea of people being able to be on a mission and to serve things. He did not want Jesuits to take on church offices. And so, you know, as you may be aware, the Pope is elected usually from the cardinals of the church uh, who are local bishops. They would be bishops uh, in different regions and then appointed to serve those regions. And normally bishops, uh, Jesuits would not uh, accept that kind of an office. Uh, sometimes in areas where there were not enough other clergy, you might have a Jesuit serve as a bishop. Uh, however, uh, the late uh, Pope John Paul II, you know, and it may have been because of his growing up in a communist era, not knowing all of the church things, he didn't uh, accept a lot of those customs of religious groups. So he was very uh, quick to appoint Jesuits as bishops uh, if he saw that they were competent and uh, well uh, prepared in a given area. And so he was the one who took uh, Jorge Bergoglio, uh, a Jesuit working in Argentina, and made him the uh, archbishop in uh, uh, Buenos Aires, and then later named him a cardinal. Uh, I mean, this is something that normally, I'm sure, uh, you know, the, the uh, Bergoglio would have refused, except the Pope says, no, you're going to do it. Okay, so he was doing it. And then I think, too, there is a certain level of uh, competence that there 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 is a uh, a personal uh, holiness that was recognized by people, a sort of uh, 
folksy style that that people liked as well and after the uh, the death of uh, or, or the resignation of pope benedict uh the, the cardinals chose him to be the uh, you know the, the pope uh, unusual unusual that you would have had a jesuit in a position who could have been elected uh not unusual that you had a man who was very uh, talented and a good communicator put in in that role but he's certainly stunned some folks with his yeah. uh views uh yeah well, I, th I think so it, it's but he's also uh you know as they, people have said the first non-european pope in well i think ever i mean you it said john paul ii was the first non-italian pope in five or six hundred years uh and then to have somebody now from the western hemisphere so the thinking is going to be different uh his pastoral approach is different certainly the approaches of the um Latin American church it, it quite quite different even theologically from the kind of thinking you find in uh in Europe and then now we're seeing that more and more and it may be a, a kind of a media ecology kind of question for us is why we we're seeing so many differences in theological expression coming to the fore uh mm -hmm. and so you have the, the the German bishops are much more uh likely now to, to stake out certain kinds of positions and you know the spaniards and the italians and then there's a uh, church dispute going on now in southern india uh the church in china but all of these things are are, are being heard more where before you might not have and the different approaches that people are taking are much more obvious now that simply could be because we have a, a greater access to media or four, you know, would have been filtered out probably. Certainly, in one of the areas that he's associated with is environmentalism. Yeah, and uh, that you know becomes very interesting. I think uh, that's coming to the fore again in, mm -hmm. in his work, and uh, that ecological view, which we also mm -hmm. share with media yeah. ecology, and mm -hmm. you know, again in general semantics, where Korzybski advocated for this ecological approach, or he referred to it as organism as a whole in an environment, all those words joined with hyphens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting thing that how often people have managed to ignore their environment. Uh, and whether it's Krasipsky or media ecology or the Pope now saying, no, we need to pay attention to how we live because we are not individual actors in any of these things. Uh, you know, in a culture like our own in the U.S., where it is highly individualistic, you know, we think that we can just kind of go on and not affect others. Well, you know, you and I know that that's simply impossible. Uh, and then when we hear people calling for it, as the, the Pope has, it, it's sort of getting our attention. But clearly what the Pope is saying about the environment was no secret to people living in Argentina and in the slums where he was working and other things like that. It's no secret to the uh, people you know who are struggling with uh food insecurity or with weather problems in whichever parts of the world uh and so yes we we have to have this kind of ecological thinking and one of the problems and you know i i know i keep throwing general semantics into it but uh you know it is one of the problems is that our language is this kind of mismatch with the reality of of the world uh which is you know again why uh korzybski and again following scientific method is trying to strive for a better map for the territory to mm -hmm. uh you know find better forms of expression it's our expression which makes us miss connections so just this morning i read a news article about uh, surprisingly vultures in india uh, and they describe vultures are the kind of nature's, you know, waste management system uh, in that, you know, they would deal with corpses of animals and the digestive system of the vulture apparently kills any kind of bacteria. Uh, and so it leaves a very kind of healthy environment. But some years back in the 90s, uh, people were experimenting with a different kind of pesticide, which seemed to be safe for people and for animals. Uh, the problem was it destroyed the digestive system of the vultures. So now there are 90% fewer vultures in India, which mean that uh, animal corpses lie 
uh, uneaten or anything else, which has meant there have been huge outbreaks of bacterial diseases spread by wild animals and other things like that, because nobody thought about the bigger environmental picture. Uh, they, they, you know, focus on one problem, but missed the other. It does seem that it, at least in part that goes back to language and language use. And uh, that might be an opportunity to talk a little bit about Walter Ong, who is someone that we're, uh, we're both influenced by, uh, because a lot of Walter Ong's work uh, was related to language. Uh, of course, for him, it was coming from the study of English literature pr primarily. Mm -hmm. Um, what are your, first of all, what are your memories of Walter Ong? Uh, I remember him as a, a wonderfully kind man, also a very precise, uh, you know, you would, you'd come as a student to meet with him in his office. He'd be very organized and clear ideas and, uh, you know, suggesting, all right, you know, here's a topic that you could explore. Uh, if you needed any kind of help with that, he was terrific about, you know, directing you and things like that. Uh, in class, uh, he was a great, um, like really a lecturer because that was the form, you know, and then classes primarily at the time, although, you know, toward the, the when students are presenting their work, it kind of switched around a little bit as, as we still would do. Uh, and then I do re remember, you know, he he had this wonderful mental organization. He could find anything, you know, you go to ask something in his office, he'd go and go to know exactly where the book was or the thing in the filing cabinet. You know, they're all, they're all very positive memories. And then later, uh, you know, I'd kept in touch with him. You know, he'd always be so good on on responding, whether it's phone calls or letters and down the line to emails. And, and I was interested to learn, uh, you know, much later on about, uh, you know, first of all, that he was an early advocate of evolution when mm -hmm. the uh, kind of, I guess the doctrine in the church rejected it, uh, but he was there with Teilhard de Chardin, yeah. who also sought to incorporate uh, the concept of evolution into, mm -hmm. in, into theology, and that he also had something of a background in biology uh, and uh, certainly an appreciation for nature. Yeah, I mean, he, he was a great... Uh, reader and student of anything, you know, vast intellectual curiosity. Uh, and he would, you know, and, and it wouldn't just be a passing knowledge, but he would dig into it to be able to uh, to, to address that. Uh, I, 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 I'd, reading uh, not too long ago, there's a, a book of some of the thought of uh, in the papers of Marcel Yus, uh, who again now is seen as, as an early uh, orality literacy kind of researcher, a French uh, anthropologist, J-O-U-S-S-E. And, uh, but what stunned me is that Yus also was living in Paris uh, and teaching at one of the, uh, the the University of Paris areas. I think he was in the same Jesuit house that Ong was living in and Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, I, I can't be sure that I haven't done the research on it, but that the, the calendar sort of lines up right and it just struck me i mean what an incredible dinner table conversation this would be if you had these three guys uh but i you know it was one of the ways because ong was looking at at that point the educational reforms of peter ramus and he was in europe because he was tracking things down in libraries and ramus had been based in paris uh, and to get that sense of the oral culture which had been what the use was looking at, you know, was a kind of breakthrough for him when Ong talks about recognizing the difference between a, a, a language that would be influenced more by the spoken word versus the visualization. You know, Ong compared it between the, the, the Hebrew way of thinking biblically, which was all by hearing, versus the Greek way, which was often by seeing or by writing. And it it's a lot of that visual orientation that leads to a more abstract mode of thought. Yeah. And of course, that was Peter Ramus's educational reform to kind of reduce everything to almost now diagrams. Uh, and Ong reproduces some of those in the book, and you get these branching logical diagrams. Uh, and it does shift things from the kind of uh, rhetoric and dialectic 
that would have been common in Europe up to the 16th, 17th century into something more suited to the printed page. And also kind of amplifies Aristotelian thinking, yeah. mm -hmm. which uh, and I think that also was something that was amplified before that by Aquinas. Mm -hmm. um, but to push it into this very highly visual territory. Yeah, well, what uh, in, in my own uh, thinking on some of this, what we're looking or seeing is different styles of information management. Uh, so an oral culture, of course, can manage the information that it knows and works with. Uh, Aquinas comes up with a different system for theology, which is dependent more on writing. Uh, and But it's, it's a bridge period because he's still in an oral educational culture, but he's moving to written kinds of organization of the, the ideas. Uh, when you get to the print world, you know, they're almost completely out of the oral and into printed based sort of organizational uh, information organization. And I think that's what the general semantics is picking up on is to seeing how these different ways of organizing information start having an impact on the society. And, and you know, just to get back to that, I mean, the importance of being grounded in direct observation and understanding, you know, experience of nature, you know, to actually mm -hmm. look at the world and not just lo try to logic things out on, you know, kind of in an internal way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and when we're, we're in that, in the midst of that again, because we have been changing again to a different kind of information management system as it's supported by uh, computer-based storage and, and computer-based algorithms and, and things like that, which we're never quite sure what to do with. We, we're getting caught by surprise. You know, why does this particular thing happen? Well, it's a totally different way of organizing the world. And that does make me also think about that posthumous work that was published uh, mm -hmm. by uh, on uh, languages hermeneutic. This was certainly the direction of his thinking toward the end of his life. Uh, Ong had, after the orality and literacy and some of the other works of uh, oral culture, uh, it had continued an interest in these sorts of things. But what he realized is that the farther one went from a face-to-face -face interaction, the more one needed a hermeneutic approach of one kind or another. Uh, and so if we are face-to-face -face speaking, we can simply ask, well, what did you mean? Uh, if you have a language difference and there is an interpreter in the middle, and that, of course, was the place of the Greek god Hermes, he was the interpreter, he would have to interpret what your thought expressed in one language to my thought expressed in another language. Uh, if we put a different medium in between, like writing, there is a need for interpretation as well, uh, and perhaps more complex as you move through time. I might have a written text from 500 years ago, and I have to do some interpretation. And so Ong was thinking the farther you got from the face-to-face, -face, the more interpretation one needed. So, the, so he did one of those other things he calls hermeneutics forever. Uh, and then as we move into, you know, from a written text or follow McLuhan's idea that the context of any medium is always another medium, uh, the more layers we get in between that, the greater the need for some hermeneutic. And then finally in the digital world where it, it's a, almost an enshrined hermeneutic, there has to be uh, an interpretation because you know, I could take a text, let's say even from the, the medieval period, and still be able to translate those written symbols into Latin or into Middle English or whatever it might have been and make it out. Now, if you would show any of us raw computer anything, it's absolutely meaningless. It has to be interpreted first by the machine and then by the, the thinker. So that's the Ong was playing with those kinds of things. What does this mean for us to be in a world of interpretation? a uh, world of hermeneutics. Yeah. And 
you know, on the other end of it, that is even in that face-to-face -face situation, we're still have to interpret each other yeah. uh, mm -hmm. because language is not mm -hmm. direct experience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and we're constantly working with the, the kind of added nonverbal hints that might help us, uh, you know, and then we're not even anywhere close to ideas of deception, uh, which tend to add a whole other level of uncertainty into our interpretation. So speaking of interpretation, because that is what theology is very much about, uh, and why don't we talk a bit about your new book? Uh, just came out. Uh, was it last year? Last year, the end of last year. Uh, late last year, a media ecology of theology. Uh, the subtitle is "Communicating Faith Throughout the Christian Tradition." Uh, what is a media ecology of theology? Well, it, it's an attempt to explore how the different media have influenced Christian thinking. Uh, and so I begin with a kind of uh, commonly accepted statement that every person is going to try to understand their belief. Uh, you know, we just don't simply accept a belief statement, but then we, we wrestle with it. So whether it's looking or listening to the scriptures, uh, and usually as groups, we do this. I'm guessing the same thing probably happens as you gather in the synagogue. You have a uh, a text presented, and it may be that the rabbi is going to help explicate that text, explain it. Uh, same thing happens with Christianity. Uh, but Christianity has been very uh, quick to use every communication medium available to it. And as we know from media ecology, different media have different affordances. Uh, and that means that the kind of thinking uh, done with an oral discussion, so for example, uh, uh, the worship leader explaining a given text is gonna be one type of thinking. But when we move that into a writing format, uh, there is a different affordance and the different kinds of things that can happen with writing. And, and we're fairly aware of some of those because of the work of those orality and literacy scholars and other things like that. But as I look through Christianity, uh, I realize that there is a tradition of kind of reflecting on belief uh, in uh, visual expression. Uh, there's a, a tradition of Christian art, uh, whether that is to uh, use symbols as you find in, in the catacombs in, in Rome, whether you find it on uh, decorative material and sarcophagi, uh, whether we find it later in kind of the tradition of Christian art and think of some of the, the great uh, Renaissance paintings and so on, often take biblical themes. Uh, there is a Christian tradition in music uh, and it, it started with, you know, a chant and not unusual for any oral culture to be chanting their, their particular materials, but then it becomes ex expanded and expressed. And with the tradition of written music, it came out of those monasteries of realizing people could reflect differently on what they believe because of the, the medium that they were using. So what I try to do in the book is, is track some of those things down. Uh, now, even though it's, the chapters later in the book, it was one of the first kind of moments of insight for me for a, a media ecology thing was going into different churches, Christian churches, uh, which are themselves a physical environment. Uh, and you go into a worship space and you begin to be overwhelmed by whether the, the dimensions of the space itself, the arrangement of the space, the decoration of the space, uh, the, the placement of where different people who are participating in the worship can be. Uh, and then couple that with 16th century changes. During the Reformation, there was a theological upheaval uh, within Western Christianity, and that is manifest in their churches. You look at a Reformed Christian tradition church, and it is so different from a Roman Catholic church, which tended to, to kind of continue the tradition. Uh, and then you, the theology is just written right into the, the architecture of the building. Uh, you know, and so the, those, I began thinking in that line, and then I said, well, what about all these other media? 
You know, so what happens with when you go from an oral theology to a written theology? What happens when that gets printed? Uh, and then it, it shows up as well in the educational system because you need to teach the next generation how to use these tools. Uh, and that's going to foster the tools. The environment we create creates the next generation. Uh, and then all the way to now, I and mean, we, we see this in uh, film and television, people wrestling with questions of faith. Uh, mm -hmm. We see it certainly on social media, but it's so early on social media, we're not quite sure what's going on. But so, you've, sorry, you've, that's the, the quick summary. Yeah. And, and you've spent uh, you know, well before this book, I mean, you've had a lot of experience sort of exploring the idea of the Bible being translated into newer technological forms. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, I mean, Christianity, too, is different that it it, it accepts its scriptures in translation, mm -hmm. uh, or I think, you know, largely, you know, I may be wrong on this, but in the synagogue, you probably are going to listen to the scriptures in Hebrew. Uh, and I remember our dean here uh, preparing, helping prepare his son, you know, for his bar mitzvah, and very curiously asked me if I could suggest some good texts that this young man could could use, you know, for the, uh, you know, and then it, it, uh, Islam, you know, the, the Quran exists only in Arabic. Uh, Christians are always translating their Bible and then using different you know, media. Uh, whether it could be the audio book kind of form, which is ironically going back to the oral culture, uh, but the Braille, uh, you know, biblical editions, and then later, you know, all of the Bible films that people have tried to do. Uh, the the one thing that you had referred to, the American Bible Society, which was a group that fosters translation work, uh, very much wanted to say, could we apply the same criteria of fidelity in translation because for churches that's you know is this really the same how good is a translation could we apply that to something like a visual medium mm -hmm. and you mentioned the american bible society and as i understand it it was uh, somewhat unusual for you to be associated with them uh yes and no i mean they are a uh, an interreligious ecumenical group and so we did have on these teams, you know, the whole range of Christian groups. They, they are a Christian group, even though they will translate the, the Hebrew Bible as well. And on the, those uh, the multimedia approach, we did have Jewish scholars as well because we were looking at uh, Hebrew uh, texts. Uh, but it was it was at first I thought kind of unusual, and then gradually, you know, there there's always a history of one or two Catholics that are mixed in with it. But it it speaks to to the, uh, I guess, the sadder history of the U.S. You know, there's a lot of suspicion among different Christian groups. I, I met one man. He said, you know, I was the first Catholic he had ever met because they were taught not to mix with other groups. So when you talk about multimedia and audiovisual media, film and television, uh, brings to mind some of Neil Postman's criticisms about mm -hmm what happens when religion is taken out of the house of worship and out of the text, you know, out of the mm -hmm. book. And, you know, there is, of course, the long tradition. And I was interested to learn that it was the uh, Muslims who refer to the Jews and the Christians as peoples of the book. Yeah. Uh, that's where those phrases come from. Mm -hmm. and, and I know the Protestants also sometimes uh, refer to themselves as people of the book uh, mm -hmm. and certainly uh, Jews have adopted that wholeheartedly but uh, you know for postmen that becomes highly uh, problematic and, and in a sense irrelig irreligious when mm -hmm. you try to translate it into yeah. those sort of forms so I was wondering what you thought about that view. No I, I think th that view is very important to consider because Again, later when a media ecology thing tells us we should be sensitive, not just to the affordances of a given medium, but also to the uh, trappings of the medium. Uh, and so we, if we too quickly, for example, adapt television, I'm thinking of the television evangelists, you know, they were trying to seek a larger audience 
uh, they adapted some of the uh, evangelical kind of Christian worship, uh, which was always based in a lot of uh, performance, singing and, you know, reflection and, and uh, congregational involvement. And they said, well, this makes good television. Well, and, and the television evangelists, some of them really do produce wonderful kind of television. But what they failed to see, and what a lot of us failed to see, is that you also carry with that all of the values of television. And this is what I think Neil Postman saw, uh, you know, and he talks about even amusing ourselves to death. If we put these other things into television, we are implicitly accepting, if not endorsing, the sort of television worldview. Uh, and that the technology is more than just a, a neutral tool, but it will highlight certain kinds of things. It carries with it, for example, in the U.S., the whole idea of consumerism, uh, the advanced capitalism that goes with that. And so, surprise, surprise, the evangelists now have to do massive fundraising. And you get into a, a kind of what I think is anti-Christian embrace of money, you know, and, but, and that comes with the media. So I, th I think Postman is exactly right that we have to be aware of what we choose to do. Uh, the, the Bible Society project was in some ways a research project. You know, the question is, can we do this? And the only way you can find out, can you do it, is to try doing it, and then to go back and look to say, okay, what else comes into that as you try this kind of a translation? So there, there was an advantage, for example, in one way, uh, some of the, uh, the, the traditional textual translators would say, you know, I've never stopped to listen to what the sound of whether it's a particular uh, biblical expression in the uh, the New Testament Greek or the Hebrew Bible in the, the Hebrew language. So that I always worked from a text and I realize now I need to hear what that text is before I can move it into a different language. So, I mean, that's something that, that we had learned by saying, because the musicians on some of these things we were working with the Bible Society wanted to know what the language sound like, because if I'm going to write a piece of music to go with it, I need to know the sound. Uh, and so, you know, you, you pick up some things and you lose some things, but it was a great research project. Mm -hmm. But how do you feel about that? I mean, we're certainly, I mean, the Catholic Church was... I think maybe before anyone else uh, televising uh, religious uh, services and yeah. now streaming yeah. uh, is pretty commonplace. My congregation yeah. does it, and yeah. uh, it it is, a, a, as Postman would put it, a Faustian bargain, right? Uh, yes. You know. Yes. Yeah. Well, there, there's a wonderful little piece I read as I was doing some research for something else called there was a blog entry. On Friday, the rabbi became a televangelist. Hmm. You know, and it was this sense of having to stream the, the service and all of the questions that, I mean, the rabbi was correctly ans asking some of these, you know, we're, we're told it's not appropriate to pray in front of a mirror, and yet the screen becomes this kind of a mirror thing. Uh, what does that do to the minion, you know, if you're not there in the, the community? Uh, I, I mean, it's something we have to keep thinking about, uh, as I reflect on, I look back at what we at the Catholic Church had done, you know, you're pushed by this emergency thing, and we want to keep something going so we can stream stuff. But back in 1950, there was a lot of debate among some of the, the uh, theological advisors uh, to the church about whether we should allow Catholic worship to be televised. Uh, you know, and, and the, the choice was that, yes, they would do it, but Again, I think it's like the vultures in India. We don't think through all of the indirect consequences, the things we didn't really intend. Mm -hmm. and, and that mirror point, I mean, it, it, apart from streaming, is the idea of Zoom worship. Yeah. I, I actually was asked to write a foreword uh, for a uh, the fellow who's actually a, an artist, a painter in, in England who was very taken aback at the concept of Zoom worship and wrote a book that is pretty much a polemic against yeah. it yeah. and was, you know, uh, very 
very much inspired by Postman's arguments mm -hmm. about it, and, and so asked me to to write the foreword for the book, which I did. Um, other, and certainly in education, there's a lot of debate as well about the pluses and minuses of using Zoom. Uh, and for our audience, I should point out that we are conducting this interview via Zoom, the audio being extracted out of it, but that is how we're we are are doing that. Uh, but that, it certainly is, is more helpful to see you, your face, you know, as we're talking than if we were just simply doing this on the telephone. But is is Zoom worship legitimate? Yeah, for, for me, only as a, a kind of emergency measure. Uh, you know, now we've kept it in, and again, the church where I assist, uh, for some of the elderly members of the congregation who are still very nervous about coming into a crowded space. Yeah. Um, so, you know, okay, it's better than not having anything. Uh, we do try to send members of the congregation to visit them in person, uh, you know, and to, to kind of keep that contact going. Uh, but, you know, I'm seeing it in the younger generation as we leak, even at the college students who now we're, as you know, the group that had spent a couple of years of their high school online, they don't quite know how to negotiate the face-to-face -face college classroom. Uh, it's not that they won't learn or whatever, but there's, there is a loss. And then when I look at the university chapel, uh, there is the sense of, well, we don't really need to come in in person. And you're saying, well, hold it, that, that's a total change of the mindset. Certainly is. And, uh, you know, when you think about organized religion generally, and this is, a, uh, as to my knowledge, across the board, at least across Christianity, certainly across the, our synagogues and, and temples, that uh, affiliation is down, attendance mm -hmm. is down uh, uh, for everyone. People mm -hmm. just are not uh, participating in, in religion. Uh, and that whole new category of nuns, and not N-U-N, Father, yes, yes, but yes, yes. N-O-N-E-S, that is mm -hmm. people who are who say their religious affiliation is, you know, that is yeah. none. They check the box, none, yeah. Yeah. Uh, isn't that a ecological consequence of our new yeah. media environment? Yeah. And I mean, and that's, that's worth our reflection, because clearly the media environment is going to have an impact, you know, as you know, and as I know with media ecology, you don't want to say this is the sole cause of some particular result, but it, it's clearly mixed in there. And we are talking, I mean, we talk about the Judeo-Christian tradition and the Abrahamic religions, yeah. uh, and religions of the book and religions of the word. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, they are religions that are grounded in in language. We are at the same time talking about, as we've mentioned, you know, a this kind of audiovisual uh, media that in, in certain ways take us away from language. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it takes us away from spoken language because it's very hard to to leave language completely. You know, as as we write something or read something. You know, I'm reminded of uh, Ong's uh, title, one of his essays, you know, the writer's audience is always a fiction. You, you have to imagine somebody to communicate with, even if you're sitting down to write something. Uh, it's easier when I see you and, and we can go back and forth with things and, you know, ask the questions. But in other ways, you know, we, we have to create something for us. And the effect that might have on our religious practice when we put more filters between ourselves and one another, you know, it's also putting filters between ourselves and God. Well, that's certainly a great way to put it. It's uh, kind of reminiscent as well of the uh, Martin Buber's Eclipse of God, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which was also the eclipse of humanity that, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, it works on at both, on both uh, levels. And, mm -hmm. I think there's always going to be something more. What What's interesting is how to, for me at least, to build on where this is going, you know, the, the questions to ask from it. Uh, because interestingly, just as we were talking now, I, I realized, you know, a different way, and, and Postman himself had commented on this, when we look at the Decalogue and the, the uh, 
uh, you know, ban on graven images. It's because it's placing that image between ourselves and God. You know, God, the living God, and the living God is expressed in the spoken word that we are called by name or addressed. And it's not something that I can sort of, you know, make something up. Uh, and so I think, you know, there, there's a, there are tons of places for reflection. And whether we take our, uh, you know, set of steps coming from general somatics or from media ecology, uh, they're at least telling us to be much more aware of the environment in which these things happen. Uh, you know, I had to, to learn something about music to write about how Christianity made use of music. Uh, I had to learn something about architecture to see, you know, that that kind of hunch that you have that, yeah, that this space, this building's doing something to me. And a lot of times we just are taught to ignore that. And, you know, we need to sort of pay attention to it. So I guess that's what I would say. Let's take these media ecology sensitivities, the sensitivities of general somatics, and start putting them into our daily living. Oh, and and when you said to be called, um, and we say, as far as language is concerned, uh, that that is a, a name is what I am called, uh, a word is what this object is called, uh, and that word call, I, I think I find very significant because it brings to mind that it is something that we do it's an action to be called uh or to or to call mm -hmm. and uh it, it's also about a calling which uh mm -hmm. i imagine is something near and dear to yeah. you yeah. Uh, to to be called mm -hmm. and to have a mm -hmm. calling um yeah. which sometimes we use that word and forget that idea that of it being of, of a calling being issued mm -hmm. from some source yes yeah yeah, very much so. Well, I think we've had a uh, really a very enlightening talk here, one that we were called on to yes. uh, to continue at some point. Mm -hmm. We are called on to continue yes. at some yes. point. So I want to thank you, Paul. You're very welcome. It's been, it's been uh, great uh, chatting with you and to uh, to see with, with the time that we can talk. You know, so often when we get to the... Uh, conferences and stuff you know you get the five minutes here and the five minutes there so it's it's nice to take a little more extended time it is and so uh, thank you very much until we meet again yes yes indeed <laughs> thank okay. you thanks you've been listening to our august 2023 episode of semantic reactions featuring an interview with author and educator father paul sukup if you like what you've heard or even if you haven't please consider becoming a member of the Institute of General Semantics if you're not one already. In addition to supporting our efforts, IGS members receive an annual subscription to our journal, etc., a review of general semantics, access to our online and in-person events, lectures, and seminars, and discounts on the books and audiovisual materials that we sell. Regular membership is only $50 and half off for students. Your membership and any additional donations you care to make will help to support our offerings and activities as we work to bring a measure of sanity to the world. The Institute of General Semantics is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to research and education on a wide range of topics. They include language and symbols, meaning and perception, communication and representation, media and technology, science and epistemology, creativity, and critical thinking. We are dedicated to making the world a better place through practical strategies for improving our semantic environment, individually and collectively. For more information about the Institute and our activities, and to become a member and supporter of our work, please visit our website at generalsemantics.org. That's generalsemantics, one word, dot org. And this brings to a close our 12th episode of Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. This is Ben Houck signing off saying, we hope you'll join us next time. And until then, just remember this simple fact, that the map is not the territory.